You're allowed to laugh, okay? What is light without darkness? This is what Tim Curry's character of darkness ponders in the 1985 film Legend. This fairy tale film from visionary director Ridley Scott would start filming in 1984. And even though the movie followed characters through a magical world, it would end up running into some very real problems. Scott was able to snatch up a new young actor just before he was about to become one of the biggest stars in the world and pit him against a well-respected actor known for taking chances in the parts he chose to play. Little did Scott know that making the film was only the first dragon he would have to slay. Getting it released was gonna be even harder. Let's find out how Legend became a fairy tale warning of making films in the studio system here on What the F*** Happened to This Movie? Ridley Scott had always been a fan of fairy tales. As he was wrapping up his film The Duelist, he thought it might be fun to create a brand new fairy tale for his next movie. He went and reread all of the stories from the Brothers Grimm and set out to think about what he could do that might be interesting. After a while, he put the idea aside as he worried it might be too much of an art house project and wouldn't pull in the mainstream audience. Instead, he went on to make the classic sci-fi film Alien and began pre-production work on a little movie called Dune. When that film fell apart and went to David Lynch to direct, he circled back again to the fairy tale idea. Scott felt it would be best to create an all new story rather than try to adapt something that was already well known. It would be easier to build it from the ground up for a film than to try to change certain aspects of the story to fit into the visual medium. He came up with the general idea of a young hermit who lived in the woods that would be transformed into a hero to fight darkness and save a beautiful princess. In doing so, he would release the world from a wintry curse that had taken over. While he was figuring out how to approach the script for the film, he discovered the works of American author William Jortsberg. He loved the work and soon discovered that Jortsberg had already written a few scripts for low budget films. Scott knew he would understand how to craft a visual story and asked him if he wanted to write a fairy tale. When Jortsberg said he had already been working on a couple of them, Scott knew he asked the right person. In 1981, just before Scott was headed off to make Blade Runner, he grabbed Jortson and they spent five weeks hammering out the storyline for what they were calling Legend of Darkness. Scott knew there had to be a quest for the characters to go on and had the idea of something trying to capture the fastest animal in the forest. This would eventually become the unicorn that would become a central crux of the story. When Scott returned from making Blade Runner, he discovered that they had a script that was too long very expensive and hard to sell. The character of Lily had originally been a princess that was transformed into a clawed creature that was whipped and eventually seduced by darkness. Parts of the story were very dark and horrific. And, and, and she said, well, there's only one thing I, I have to say about this script. And I said, yes, he said, you can't have the villain f the princess. They began to take out sections of the story that didn't feed into the main quest. After some back and forth, they rewrote the script 15 times, which seemed to do the trick and they were happy with the new version of the story. In Legend, Darkness sends his goblins to bring him the horns from the last unicorns alive. Once they have been taken, the world will be plunged into night and Darkness can then rule. At the same time, a young princess goes into the forest to find Jack, the young boy she loves that lives there. He tells her that he'll take her to see the fabled unicorns today. When he takes her to where they live, she breaks free of his grasp and runs to them. She touches one and the animals then run off. We see that the goblins have shot one of the unicorns with a poison dart. They hunt the unicorn down and sever its horn. Once this is done, the world plunges into a dark winter. Lily runs to the nearby cottage and sees that everything has been frozen in time. The goblins come and she overhears darkness tell them that the world won't fall into permanent darkness until the last unicorn is killed. Jack teams up with some of his forest friends to protect that last living unicorn, but soon learns that Lily has been captured and that the unicorn is in deep trouble. 
the group travels into Darkness's domain to rescue Lily and set the mythical creature free. If they can complete this quest, the world will return to normal and Darkness will once again be banished from the living world. Ridley Scott began casting for this film and wanted someone with a theatrical presence for the role of Darkness. He began to think about Tim Curry's brilliant performance in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Darkness needed to be threatening, but also at times seductive. He felt that Curry could easily fill that role. And Curry found the story intriguing, so he signed on. Um. For Jack, they auditioned a lot of young actors. Among the group, were Jim Carrey, Johnny Depp, and Robert Downey Jr. Ultimately, they went with Tom Cruise, who brings a young innocence to the role. Scott met Mia Sara in a casting session and loved her theatrical instincts, and he hired her, even though she was only 15 at the time. When it came to the look of the creatures in the film, Scott hired special effects master Rob Bottin. Really had wanted him to work with him on Blade Runner, but Botine was already locked into working on John Carpenter's The Thing. Scott told him about Legend, and Botine thought it would be a great opportunity to create a wide array of creatures, and so he signed on as well. Performer Alice Platon was asked if she had any ideas for the look of the goblin Blix. She wasn't sure if Scott would go for it, but she mentioned that what she had in mind was to make the creature look like Keith Richards. And there was this pause on the phone, this transatlantic phone call. Scott sat for a second and then agreed that that would look really cool if they extended the nose and added the pointy ears. And really says, yeah, you know, he goes, Keith has a great face. The makeup ended up being so convincing that when Tim Curry was visiting the set before he had to get into makeup, he met some of the other performers. Clayton was in her full makeup, and when Curry met her... But he kept looking at me thinking, boy, you look familiar. But he couldn't quite place it. I knew why he was feeling that, and I just made him think and think and think, and finally I said, Keith Richards, and he said, oh my God, that's it. Curry immediately saw it and started laughing. What? What? Are you getting bored? I'm all right. Sure. When it came time to create darkness, Scott hoped to showcase an amazing visual that hadn't been put on film before. The idea was to give him the cool visual with the giant horns and make him a hulking presence. Interesting thing about Rob is that not just an artist, he's an engineer. You've got to think about weight, you've got to think about ergonomics, you've got to think about how the guy's going to move in it. How the hell do I put two horns like that with the leverage on what? On his scalp? I can't put a helmet on him because his head will go too big. It was decided to create an apparatus that would strap onto Curry's head to hold the horns, then a bodysuit to give Darkness a muscled physique and finally, lifts to make him appear taller. When the costume was all put together, Darkness would stand about 7 feet 3 inches. He towered over the smaller crews, which gives the character a great presence. Because the form of the horns went straight outward instead of upwards, it caused a serious strain on Curry's neck during fittings. Fortunately, they were able to reduce the weight of the horns dramatically. Scott was impressed with how light the horns ended up being. They looked heavy, but they could withstand minimal use without breaking. It was perfect for what they needed, and the makeup became one of the greatest visuals in all of cinema. Initially, it was quite amusing, actually. He'd go, oh, complain, complain, complain. And then finally, put him in, and he stood up, and he turned, and he faced the mirror, and went, oh. He liked the way he looked. For Meg Mucklebones, Botine based her look off of the old witch form the Queen takes in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He made her more extreme looking and the entire thing was made out of foam latex. Performer Robert Picardo, yes, the doctor from Star Trek Voyager, played Meg Mucklebones and he said it was tough playing the character in the water. She was supposed to burst out and quickly approach Jack. He said that when they would lower him into the water, the foam latex suit would begin absorbing water, so when he burst up in the frame, water would go flying everywhere and then begin to leak out of the suit into the seaweed covering parts of his body. It ended up being a great visual on camera but was grueling while shooting. The entire forest was built at Pinewood Studios. Scott took a trip to the Sequoia National Forest to research how he wanted this forest to look. He liked the giant trees and had some built on the set. 
It went all the way up to the ceiling, and it felt like you were really in a forest setting when you walked in. Everything they ended up filming in the forest set, however, had to be dubbed over later because of the abundance of noise. There were lots of fans and mechanical equipment being used. Even the scenes without the use of all this were problematic because local birds had found their way into the studio and had taken up residence in the large fake trees. The solution was to make 40 frames in steel, which would hang from a rail around the gantry. When I look at the stage, it runs out of space, but run the mirror behind it, Christ almighty, I see eternity. So we have that forest in there with mirrors rather than special effects. One day, while everyone was at lunch, the studio the forest was in caught fire. A large tower of smoke could be seen miles away. They still had 10 days left of shooting on the set, and now the entire forest set had been destroyed. It was determined that since the crew had been using a gas line for some of the campfires, fumes had gathered in the top of the studio and eventually ignited. Luck would have it that most of the cast and crew weren't on set due to lunch. If so, there would have been some major tragedies going on. Scott even commented in the making of doc on the DVD that some of the crew would have been up on the walkways near the top of the studio and they would have been trapped when the fire started. Scott was able to readjust the shooting schedule and had smaller sections of the forest built on another soundstage and ended up only going over by three days. Because of this, the setting where Lily and Jack meet the unicorns was moved to a garden that was located on the grounds of Pinewood. The amount of greenery matched well with what the set had originally intended and everyone agreed it ended up being the perfect setting. Once the film wrapped, attention turned to editing. This is where Scott was hit with the dreaded studio notes. The film that Scott was putting together reflected a throwback to classic fairy tales, and he got Jerry Goldsmith to create an orchestral score that helped enhance that feeling. The film was sent out for multiple test screenings, and Scott admits that some of the comments from the audience members shook his confidence in the running time. He then trimmed it down from 2 hours and 30 minutes minutes to one hour and 38 minutes. Studio execs were also worried about the film and started to give their own suggestions. They wanted to appeal to a younger demographic and commissioned a score from Tangerine Dream. This was vastly different from what Goldsmith had done and changed some of the tone of the film. In a compromise, Scott was able to keep the original Goldsmith score for the European release, but the US release would include the new music. Even some of the actors' voices were changed. A studio exec stated that they thought the character of Gump, played by German actor David Bennett, sounded too German, so the character was redubbed by Alice Platon, who played Blix. The film itself would undergo even more edits. Scott has stated that the film lost some of the magic it originally had. He felt the original story expressed how everyone had their own flaws and would try to overcome them. Jack was supposed to be portrayed as being lustful over Princess Lily, but would later prove his true love for her. Gump is shown to have a bad temper when he didn't get what he wanted. Lily is seen as greedy throughout the film as she's always taking things or constantly trying to go where she's been expressively forbidden to go. When the film was changed, Scott said it was pushed into more of a stereotypical 80s fantasy film. Tom Cruise was so unhappy with the American cut that he refused to talk about it for years. In 2002, Scott was given the chance to produce a director's cut of the film. This added in new scenes and even replaced some scenes with alternate takes. The first order of business was to add back in the Goldsmith score. When they went to find the original masters of the recordings though, they couldn't be found. Scott was worried that the original score wouldn't be able to be used for the new cut. Luckily, an engineer at the studio had kept a two-track digital copy, more or less because he thought it was worth preserving. They were able to use that to recut the music for use in the director's cut. In this new version, we even get to see a new ending. While it's not a major change, it does switch things up a bit. The original ending had Jack and Lily running into the forest as they turn to wave goodbye to their friends. Here. She runs out of the forest and waves at Jack, and that she'll be back to see him soon. Then, as Jack takes in that the world has been restored as it should be, turns to see his forest friends, and runs into the sunset. 
Everyone involved with the movie has pretty much universally agreed that the director's cut is far superior to the theatrical, and that it preserves what the original intent of the film was supposed to be. But some of us that came of age in the late 80s and early 90s do find it hard to let the original theatrical cut go. Still, both cuts are worth checking out. What started as a simple fairy tale did turn into a nightmarish warning of how easily things can turn to darkness. But in the end, Ridley Scott and company made a fairy tale that has withstood the test of time and is a great throwback to a simpler time. A time when movies were big spectacles and using makeup effects produced some of the most beautiful images ever put on screen. I get the point, Lord. <laughs> 